I'm going to introduce now our first speaker, Dr. Fred Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller received his bachelor's degree in agronomy from Texas A&M and his master's and PhD degrees in plant breeding also from Texas A&M University. His research while a professor at Texas A&M included evaluation, incorporation and dispersal of diversification within grain and food types of sorghum. Increased yield and stability with superior food and feed quality were paramount for his program and his research resulted in numerous awards. Dr. Miller developed and released for public use more than 1,700 improved sorghum genetic materials and published more than 350 journal articles on sorghum. He's currently the senior sorghum breeder and consultant of New Farm MMR Genetics. So please welcome Dr. Fred Miller. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a, a long day already. I have a, a unique uh, presentation style, and I hope that you will bear with me. And uh, by the end, I hope that you have some understanding of sorghum uh, from the historical point of view, the amount of diversity that exists, and some thoughts that I have of what sorghum holds for the future. I will explain my think outside the box here in uh, hopefully when I finish. The title of the slide is, of course is looking at a, a historical perspective of what sorghum is like but what I want you to see here is the background. This is a genetic garden. This is in the Sudan you'll see a diverse amount of uh, different types of sorghums that are there that uh, are what a plant breeder would like to have at his fingertips. And in that field of sorghum that was there were all of these types that were out there in the field and walking out, picking those up, and as soon as we picked up that first beautiful panicle with those very large grains on it, I thumped it and every seed fell off. Now, all of you recognize that the primary function of shattering is the dispersal of the seed for the next generation. Women, no doubt, hundreds of times, if not perhaps thousands of times, in the past, some 5,000 to 3,000 years ago, selected sorghums that didn't shatter, and they replanted it. And over the time, we now know there are two genes that control shattering in sorghum. And I like to ask my grad students, who and what were the de first domestication uh, points of view of sorghum, shattering, and women. When, when sorghum was brought to the United States uh, in the 1800s, many of these sorghums were harvested very unlike what you know the harvest of sorghum is like today. This is hagara that was brought directly from the Sudan and harvested with a butcher knife, pitched into a slide, and carried out of the field and fed to the animals. Of the 70 different working groups of sorghum that are out there, prior to 1960, there were only six of those 70 different taxonomic groups or working uh, collection differentiation types that we had in the, in the US. I want you to recognize uh, Kaffir and Milo. I can't explain right now uh, 
but the unique situation that presented itself that these two types of sorghums from different places in Africa came to the U.S. and led to the development of a whole concept of hybridization in sorghum. Sorghum is classified in, uh, primarily on panicle characteristics. And you'll see here uh, the, uh, uh, the caudatum types, the bicolor types, the, the guineensis types, which by the way have a very interesting characteristics. When they mature, the glooms twist. We call those involute glooms. And of course there are the duras and the kaffirs. Harlan and DeWitt did a wonderful job in uh, separating the, the big working groups of sorghums based on panicle uh, characteristics. Now, there were two people in the U.S. that had a major impact on the development of sorghum. J.C. Stevens and J. Roy Quinby. They were the pioneers that took what farmers brought to them every short sorghum that w happened in the, these big tall fields of introductions are things that were earlier. Mr. Quinby had this knack of, of relating to people and he would have groups of farmers or individual farmers from as far away as Kansas, Colorado, particularly Oklahoma and Texas bring him these different types of sorghums and they were the ones that that actually figured out what was happening for height and maturity in sorghum. To give you a little bit of an idea of what they did, uh, I would like to suggest that Mr. Quinby pointed out that there were four major genes that he could associate with differentiation of how long a sorghum plant grows. And I would like to direct your attention, oops, uh, to uh, uh, the difference between 100-day Milo, which is dominant at all four of the maturity loci, as contrasted to, uh, where's my SM100 up there at the top, recessive at MA1, and you'll notice that there is a difference of approximately 30 days in the number of days to flower. Each of these types uh, were identified in the program at Chillicothe that separated maturity in sorghum. Now, when I was in Puerto Rico, we grew a collection of photoperiod sensitive types of sorghums planted the 15th day of every month throughout the year. And it's interesting to look at uh, what Mr. Quinby was actually seeing was the response of uh, photoperiod. If you look at this one, Planted on February the 15th, it flowered in about uh, 55 days. Planted on the 15th of March, it took over 180 days to flower. As little as eight minutes in the length of the day caused that significant jump in how long it took the sorghum plants to grow. And you'll notice that each subsequent 15 or 30 day later planting resulted in 30 days earlier in maturity. Also note that there is a distinct correlation between maturity and height. We frequently get uh, that question asked of us, is there a relationship? Definitely. Sorghum is a terminal plant in that it takes approximately 2.5 to 3 days for each leaf to be laid down. So the longer it grows, if it grows 150 days, it's going to have 30 or so leaves. And if it matures in uh, 90 days, it's going to have significantly less. But the other interesting thing that is here is there was this group of sorghums that were totally insensitive to day length. They did not respond at all. They flowered uniformly. And to give you an example of exactly what these relate to, when Mr. Quinby and I <coughs> made a cross between uh, 
100, I'm sorry, 100-day uh, Milo and SM100 at Chillicothe, there was a beautiful separation in the SM100 where MA1 was recessive as contrasted to where MA1 was dominant. Growing the F2, we got a perfect single gene segregation pattern. Now, we took half of that F2 seed and planted it in my nursery in Puerto Rico, and you will see here that there was absolutely no segregation. The day links overwhelmed that separate, proving that MA1 is a photoperiod responsive gene. And to add to that now, uh, as I get into what the conversion program, there are four genes that regulate how tall a sorghum plant is. These four genes go from where all four of the height genes are recessive, and we have a plant that is perhaps uh, 35 inches to 36 inches tall, and as we add a dominant gene, we add 15 to 30 inches in height. And you will see here at the top where uh, everything is dominant, they are quite tall. Now, <clears throat> There was something else that was going on at this time uh, in the, the pre-1960s. John Siglinger at Oklahoma State was, uh, at Stillwater, was working on sorghum and he recognized that there was a change about to happen when after World War II, Alice Chalmer developed a combine that could be pulled behind uh, a single tractor like this to harvest wheat. Mr. Siglinger said, why not sorghum? And so he took these early short types of sorghums of which Martin, uh, Plainsman, and Caprock in Texas 7078 were the types that, that he was, had developed uh, with Mr. Quinby and Mr. Stevens. And you'll see here that outside influences such as what was happening uh, after the war where uh, there was this enormous industrial revolution going on of what to use our uh, uh, infrastructure for. Alice Chalmer built a wheat combine that was adapted to sorghum. And so we had a start in what sorghum was to be for the future. Now, going back to that kaffir and that milo that was introduced in the, the 1860s, cytoplasmic genetic male sterility was a dream that, that Mr. Stevens had at Chillicothe and worked on it for about 25 years before he, he and uh, Mr. Kirkendall actually found cytoplasmic sterility. But it was not cytoplasmic sterility in sorghum that gave them the idea. It was cytoplasmic sterility in onions that triggered the idea that we want to have this mechanism in sorghum. Various techniques of producing hybrids had been used, such as hot water emasculation, hand emasculation, uh, among and crosses among different types led them to understand that there was a 40 to 60 percent heterosis between types and as a result there was a push to produce hybrids. Cytoplasmic genetic male sterility was released by the Texas Experiment Station in 1956 and this is one of the first fields of that sorghum that was grown on the high plains of Texas. It was the extension service that had a major role in getting that basic research information out into farmers' hands. And about 200 farmers that first year tried to produce hybrid sorghum. And they didn't know what the seed set would be on the sterile. But they found out by using all those 200 different 
uh, farmers in the production fields that yes, windblown pollen would be adequate to produce a 80 to 95% seed set on that male sterile. And following that, in the 1960s, we saw an enormous explosion of what hybrid sorghum could be. You'll see here a field of sorghum that yielded probably 10,000 pounds. Today we have uh, sorghums that yield much more than that, but our national average has gone down because of the absence of irrigation water. All of the sorghums that were grown early in the 1960s were, this field for example, had seven or eight irrigations. Water was not an issue at the time. But today it's a whole different story. There's one thing that I would like to mention in the ad adaptation of hybrids by farmers was very rapid. In two years, more than 95% of farmers were growing hybrid sorghum. And people like uh, Dr. Hallauer and, and my boss, George Sprague, uh, were the leaders to why? Because of the success and demonstration of hybrid vigor in maize. So farmers knew what to expect uh, from this. And if you're ever down at Chillicothe, Texas, you can stop by and see the historical marker that is on the roadside that, that says something about the development of hybrids and the fact that much of the sorghum came from uh, the Sudan and East Africa. Now this gives you a little bit of a, uh, an idea as to how sorghum has grown. If we look at what happened when uh, the combine heights were introduced, we were uh, able to, to get our sorghums up to a little more than uh, 1,500 pounds to the acre. And then came hybrids. And wow, what a jump that we had in the average uh, national production. And then when the sorghum conversion program was introduced, we had another jump. And then there were certain uh, situations such as green bugs and downy mildew and a few of those kinds of things that began to say, okay, what's, the, what's going on here? Now, what I would like to do is to give you a little bit of an idea with that background of some of the diversity that exists in sorghum and how we were able to expand that diversity use in the temperate zones and then back to areas where the sorghums originated. This is just a little bit of, uh, oops, what happened here? Oh boy. <laughs> this is, uh, I think this is the conversion program that actually is, no, oh my goodness. My favorite slide. Uh, it's a slide that I'll have to tell you about. Uh, it depicts how sorghum was from the point of origin in uh, Ethiopia, the Sudan, Somalia, was moved westward to West Africa and back down by the Bantu into South Africa or Southern Africa and how sorghum went then from that origin center to China from India to China and how it came to the U.S. Benjamin Franklin is credited with bringing, uh, recognizing sorghum's use quickly by selecting seeds off of brooms that were uh, introduced uh, from Europe. But this gives you a little bit of an idea. I, I must apologize because I, that other slide was a, is really a very interesting one. But if we look at the center of origin here, sorghum that moved uh, east and west, uh, much like wheat and other things that moved horizontally instead of up and down. When sorghum originated perhaps 5,000, 6,000 years ago, it moved westward and then uh, the Bantu brought much of it southward into uh, southern Africa. A major part of the Kafirs uh, came from this route. 
And then the sorghums that went to India, the sorghums that went to China, and of these uh, sorghums that came all the way around, went to the U.S. Uh, via South America and across. But this gives you an idea of a little bit about some of the different species types and their uh, distribution. <clears throat> this gives you a biological relationship, if you will, of what some of these sorghums look like. If we look at, at sorghums uh, from West Africa, they do cluster when we look at them from a, a biotechnical point of view. The, these guineas, the duras from Ethiopia, the caudatums from uh, South Africa, uh, all of these, they, uh, they, they cluster quite nicely. Now, the world collection consists of about uh, 36 to 40,000 different sorghums. And uh, many of these sorghums are from Ethiopia that you see here, uh, from Sudan and uh, other places, China and so on. But amazingly, about 75% of what is in the collection today is photoperiod sensitive. There have been very, uh, that 25% were those unique types that, that came from the extremes from South Africa, uh, from China, and from the US that are in this collection. But that 75% is what we would like to look at today and say, okay, what is it that is there? We can't do very much with that if we grow it primarily in the long days because it's going to be so photoperiod sensitive that it isn't going to flower except in our greenhouses and so on. But the major question, of course, is how do we get to the, the genes that exist in these materials? This is a photo of one of uh, the sorghums that we grew in Puerto Rico uh, from a March planting. It didn't flower until uh, late December. And you can see it is quite a contrast of what we think about sorghum today. But there is the program that I think is one of those academic as well as professionally uh, plant breeding based, physiology based uh, miracles that happened in sorghum is the sorghum conversion program. And I would like for you to bear with me on the graphics and then I'll show you exactly what happened uh, first. The conversion program goes back to those first slides that I showed you of recognizing the differences in how many height genes there were how many maturity genes that we have, and so on. And as a result, we were able to uh, identify a plant, a variety that was recessive for the height genes and the maturity genes, and then we recognized this, the uh, photoperiod uh, response, and we planted those photoperiod sensitive materials in a short day environment in Puerto Rico. We made the handy masculation from a September the 15th planting. We planted the F1s before Valentine's Day, to, before the days got too long. And then we grew those uh, F2 populations at Chillicothe in the temperate zone. And we uh, selected out of those 1,000 to 1,500 plants that we grew in the F2, a short, early plant that we could uh, then take back to the short days and again cross to the exotic line. During this process, which took four back crosses, we were able to recover more than 98% uh, of the exotic chromosomes. Now, Let's look at 
uh, what these actually look like. These are the F2 populations that we grew at Chillicothe, and is, is, uh, you'll recognize this is one F2 population, four rows that were uh, over a thousand feet long, and within that was this one little short plant. Our genetics worked. We took that little short plant back to Puerto Rico and planted it and crossed it back to the exotic line. We did this for four times, but the interesting thing here was that the last back cross generation, we crossed using the exotic as the female so that we could recover the exotic cytoplasm because we were concerned that we only had one cytoplasm system in our programs, that the Milo uh, Kaffir A1 system. Today we have nine cytoplasm systems that have been identified as a result of, of this operation. When we get through with this program, we have this tall exotic line here in a short version. The only difference is the height genes and the maturity genes that were helped heterozygous, MA1 and the various height genes. This is perhaps the world's most recognized uh, best sorghum line. This is SC170, a, a zero zero from Ethiopia. And these guys in the background are the people that worked in the Texas program uh, at the time. Richard Fredrickson, Lloyd Rooney, Daryl Rooney, now Jerry Johnson and Ed Clark in my nursery. What I wanted to show you with this slide is uh, to say that you can see where these particular sorghums came from. Ethiopia, the Sudan, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. These were the top 10 converted materials that we got out of the, that original conversion process. And they have basically changed what that original sorghum hybrid system looked like. So what is it that we look at when we see a field or a breeder's nursery of something like this? All of our program uh, that we do, we base ours on handy masculations, and uh, it's very easy. We now know what the genetics of pericarp color is. There are two genes that control the color. We know that we've only been able to find varying amounts of carotenoids in some varieties, particularly from uh, Nigeria. We know that there are two genes that control whether there's a pigmented testa, and we know that there are two colors of that testa. This is without a pigmented testa, but I can tell you that this plant was purple plant color uh, because of the, the puncture wound that that uh, plant suffered uh, by an insect. And this is the pigmented test of which can be the brown or purple. This is the sodium hydroxide test that was developed to separate uh, brown sorghums, those with a pigmented testa versus those that were not. And in addition to that, when we look at white sorghums for the food industry, we say, okay, it's white. But all white sorghums are not created equal because of the anthocyanins or tannins uh, or flavonoids that are embedded in the plant. And so we select these most uh, sorghums that, that have the least amount of phenols, et cetera, in the finished food product. This is an example of the color uh, that exists in the plant. Most all of the sorghums that were introduced originally into the U.S. were this uh, purple plant color, and a very few were tan. But we f soon found that, that people in Africa and India were selecting the tan types for use in the food industry. And uh, this is just the, the genetics of that. And that particular characteristic applies not only to the leaf, but also to uh, the glooms, 
the purple plant color and the straw or tan plant color types. So when we see a field like this, they're both white sorghums, but you can quickly see that there's a difference between this one and this one. And the only thing is that this uh, is tan plant color and this one is purple plant color. Prior to the conversion program, we had no concept of what existed in the food industry or could be used for foods in sorghum. In the U.S., we were using it primarily for animal feed. And as a result, we did not know what those, those uh, criteria were that uh, people had selected over time to produce food types. Today, I like to say that, that we have a growing food industry in the U.S. Uh, based on white sorghum grains. I was told by the National Sorghum Checkoff Board that they now recognize over a thousand uh, food products in the marketplace that, that use sorghum flour, particularly in the celiac uh, gluten-free market and some of the food products that are made. But once we get to that point, there were other things that came out of the conversion program that we were particularly interested in looking at. Herbicide resistance, very important and ongoing. Resistance to salinity. Even though sorghum is grown in an arid uh, environment, we are confronted with uh, saline soils where that happens. We need to change the quality of the protein that exists in our grain and in the different kinds of milling and decorticating types of sorghums. Even though sorghum is a drought resistant uh, grass, we need to be able to increase its drought resistance. Some of the things that have come out of the program uh, are listed here. We now have good anthracnose resistance, head smut, and other uh, resistances. This is uh, uh, Periconia root rot, and you can see how the materials have been selected in a nursery like that. Insect resistance, uh, midge, green bugs, and now today uh, we are confronted with a new uh, insect problem, the sugarcane aphid, which is creating many, many problems. But with the materials that have come out of the, the conversion program, we have identified resistance. This is a field that by chance had been sprayed with a cotton insecticide and we were able to identify types that withstood uh, insecticidal drift and maintain uh, leaf area. But you can uh, see that there are other traits such as changes in non-structural carbohydrates that are available today in the biomass market and the energy market. Lodging resistance and as I indicated earlier, differences in cytoplasmic sterility systems. Today in the marketplace, we do not rely primarily on uh, or totally on A1 cytoplasm. There are hybrids out there that are in the A2 system as well as in the A3 system. This is, for those of you who don't know how hybrids are produced, this is one of the the, the ideas that is used. Out of that original program, there were some 700 uh, materials that were fully converted and distributed, and we distributed materials back to every single country program that these materials came from uh, prior to conversion. And we have found that, that uh, whether the materials have gone back to the Sudan, Ethiopia, or China, many of these materials are also useful today. Currently, there's a new conversion program based on what we learned from the first, looking at uh, the CAFR, uh, the, the caudatums and the duras. This is my nursery in, in Puerto Vallarta. And what we have done here is to separate these types of sorghums 
that uh, are the, the Duras from Ethiopia and the Caudatums uh, from the Sudan. Interestingly enough, this is that small group of diversity that exists in the Texas breeding program even to today. So uh, there still is a large amount of diversity out there to be gained and utilized. The program today is based on combining biotechnology with what we had already learned about uh, uh, the conversion process. We have selected these specific types. We have sequenced all the parents and then we choose the 15 shortest earliest materials out of the F2 population. And from those then we uh, go in and identify the best materials to be backcrossed to reduce the number of generations. I want to show you this uh, before I finish. This is chromosome six where uh, MA1 and DW2 are located and M, uh, MA6 is located on the distal end of chromosome six. But this is the exotic line that has been identified or characterized with some 14,000 markers as contrasted to the non-recurrent parent here. And we, uh, out of those 15, uh, 15, we chose these five to continue, but you'll notice that we chose this particular one that had the greater amount of recovery of the, uh, the markers in that identification system. Now, we back crossed that one more time and with just one additional back cross, we have now uh, recovered more than 85% of the uh, 14,000 markers. So it's uh, very useful in uh, making that material quicker to convert using a combination of marker-assisted selection. These are some of the, the short lines that have been identified and the long uh, duration types. And this is the diversity that exists in that nursery uh, which is released uh, to anyone who wants to use the material out of the conversion program. Just to give you an idea, again, of a different version of what diversity that exists in the material. We had no idea that there were types that restored or did not restore fertility to the A1 system of sterility using caudatum or duras. All of our types of females have been developed out of CAFR. And I think with that I will stop since I see my time is up. Uh, but I, I thank you very much and it's been a pleasure working with sorghum over these years. And I hope that, that uh, and I know that all of the people, the young people that are working here today on, on graduate degrees I encourage you strongly to, as was said earlier, to establish linkages with not just other plant breeders, but other people of like scientific minds, because it's linkages that give you different ideas. And who wants to stay in the same box? If you don't think outside the box, you don't change the status quo. Thank you very much. Hello. Uh, Dr. Miller, we actually, if you'd like to finish your presentation, we're actually a little bit ahead of schedule, so you'd be more than welcome to finish your slides. You've got plenty of time to do so. I don't, but if you'd like to stop here, you're more than welcome. Okay, to. well, I, I can go on because the last part is about my thoughts to the future. Sure, we'd love to hear that, so please, yeah, continue. 
one of the things that we had problems with, with working with these photoperiod sensitive materials and making judgments about looking for combining ability and heterosis, they're photoperiod sensitive. We can't look at yield of grain in the long days with these materials. So what we have to do is to make our hybrids in the short days and grow the hybrids in replicated trials in the short days. So all of our evaluations of combining ability for yield of grain were done in the short days in either Puerto Vallarta or my West Puerto Rico. So uh, as I said, looking for new females and increased diversity in the females and uh, producing these hybrids in the short days so that we could identify best sources of heterosis for grain yield. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't really want you to, uh, as much as you can read here, but some of the ideas that I have for the future, broken down into some different groups, these are types of things that I think that will come from our understanding of sorghum for human foods. Whether, you know, we're seeing new types of antioxidants come out. There's gonna be nutraceuticals. We already know that sorghum is an incredibly good high glycemic index food because of its lower digestive tract utilization. It's all of those people are gluten free. The products that, that are in the marketplace today, there's a company called Wonder Grain out of Florida that is marketing some uh, sorghum today that is just phenomenal. I encourage you to look at their website. Uh, but in order to keep us going, we've got to change uh, and look at milling characteristics, changes in protein content, rearrangement, and hopefully get around some of the government policy regulations that, that influence us. And we, the National Sorghum uh, Checkoff Board has done an enormous uh, amount of good in changing that. But human food was not known in the U.S. for sorghum until the conversion program came along. So that's been one of the major things. But if we look at forage sorghums, uh, there's always the push for increased yields. Uh, we need, of course, biotic and abiotic uh, resistances to make that greater. We all are searching for greater photosynthetic efficiency, differences in increased growth rates. Even Mr. Quinby's work and, and other scientists prior to the 1940s, growth rate growth rate was the important thing that they kept looking for. But today we want to see how differences and changes in structural and non-structural carbohydrates uh, impact digestibility. Even though sorghum is a very good drought resistant uh, grass, we need to look at different types. We know that there are different types out there, uh, different mechanisms. Uh, even looking at salinity tolerance, the salinity tolerance that exists in lettuce, for example, the different mechanisms that are there, they also work in sorghum. And as I said, I encourage you guys to, to look outside the discipline uh, just of plant breeding to make sure that, that you really understand uh, the challenges and uh, future utilizations. In poultry and livestock, the really big problem that we have is with the amino acids. We need to increase lysine and methionine and perhaps change the, the caffrin content, the glue that holds the starch granules in place inside that, that uh, caryopsis, and to change the digestibility of the starch. Uh, I think looking at delayed digestion is still important. Uh, but we need to spread that digestion over the whole gut rather than just leaving it uh, for the small intestine to be the major source of digestibility. And of course, always it's gain, it's performance that is important. Now the new thing that we're looking at today is, is energy from sorghum. Uh, sorghum is a wonderful crop because it is a perennial. It grows continuously. Uh, in Puerto Rico, we grew one crop for seven different harvests. So we know that, that it can be done multiple times. Whether we're going to make 
uh, methane out of it, which is what you see in the background, a methane generator in Germany, uh, whether we use uh, cellulose or grain or sugars for ethanol production. And the biggest thing is the future use of cellulose, whether it be from sorghum or other things, and to look at, at different kinds of lignin that are of different digestibilities. There are, as most of you know, there are big, thick books written on just lignin. And the digestibility of different kinds of lignins are great. Whether we make gas, compressed gas, solvents, polymers, or the big thing that is going on today is making pellets like barbecue chips out of sorghum. Uh, one of the company's uh, next step is already uh, producing pellets and shipping them to England uh, because of the shortage of wood in uh, England. And there are all kinds of downstream things, whether we can uh, make gasoline out of uh, sorghum uh, directly, there are some indications that that can be done. The University of California has uh, one project underway to do that. And the whole area of pharmaceuticals, it's amazing what, what is there and is known in bits and pieces scattered around the world. The anti-aging uh, anti antioxidants, all kinds of skin care things. So the ladies in the Sudan use the black sorghums uh, to color their skin for weddings and uh, different kinds of ceremonial activities. We know that we can uh, look at uh, glycemic index for diet control and prolonging the, the energy range for digestion. Anti-cancer medications and nutrition. We also know that, that sorghum has antifungal characteristics that can be extracted from the diversity. And interestingly enough, reading an article from Argentina not too long ago was that a scientist there is using some of the high phenolic uh, sorghum grains as anti-parasites in livestock. And of course, antibiotics. Of course, all of these are based on uh, different things that are yet only partially known. And it's up to you guys to figure out all of the, the real fun things. And of course, the industrials, whether we can make pellets, liners, shipping containers, different kinds of wrapping materials, foams, building materials, plastics, etc. All of which can be biodegradable. Today there are already floorings, wood floorings that are made out of sorghum. I had some really wonderful experiences in China where people were giving me uh, pieces of plywood that were actually compressed stems of sorghum beautiful, beautiful adhesives and binding agents and so on. All of this and many, many, many more things are there to be discovered. But I want to bring back to one important thing is, is as was pointed out earlier, it's connections. You'll see here uh, Mr. Quinby, a farmer. This is Nick Kramer at the Lubbock Experiment Station. Uh, Murray Cox, who at the time was uh, the communications director, if you will. Uh, Murray Cox was the word to the farmer over the radios. WBAP, Dallas, Fort Worth. Every morning, my mother and father got up and listened to Murray Cox. And Murray Cox was constantly in touch with, with people like... Uh, these guys that were out there on the front lines. So whether it be extension people today or uh, your colleagues in, in mechanical engineering or certainly in physiology and statistics, establish those relationships because they are the ones that are going to allow you to, to think outside the box. I used to think that I could just draw a box and say, you know, think outside the box and I began to see. You know, this is not overwhelming enough. The Hubble te telescope, I found this on the internet. I thought, wow, think outside the box now. The box is really small. And to be able to, 
to think outside the box is what we're all about because we have the basics. That's what you come here to do is to learn the basics. Uh, and when you get out and go to work, that's when you become really effective in pulling all of that outside the box. Now, thank you very much. Questions now or later. Well, thank you for coming. You had a much longer travel than any of us ever wanted for you to have. Um, and I'll open it up for questions. I missed uh, that last part. Okay. Uh, first question is, uh, is there any correlation between the plant height and the yield? And another one is, uh, what's the major concern when selection uh, for the plant height? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a definite correlation between uh, both maturity and height in sorghum and yield but it reaches a level of uh, diminishing returns. We like to say that, uh, a pro well, we say the two dwarf types of sorghum. When you get up to 170 uh, centimeters, you're about at maximum yield. Uh, once you get beyond that, the, fit, the photosynthetic activity of the plant goes to maintaining the plant rather than going into yield of grain. I'm speaking of, of grain, I presume that's what you were speaking of. Um, <laughs> completely lost the last question. Okay, thank you. There definitely will be a competition there. Uh, I'm sure that, that uh, as maize breeders develop more drought resistance, uh, I, I really don't know what that's, the economics of that's going to be. I have heard uh, that it is, of course it's de location dependent, but 110 to 150 bushels of, of maize, if you can't do that, you need to be growing sorghum. Uh, so the sorghum, of course, is a much more economical crop to, to grow. And fortunately now that there is a parity <clears throat> uh, from government regulation, we are on a same pricing basis foot level so that there is going to be expansion uh, and more direct competition at uh, the, the marginal areas for maize. Um, Dr. Miller, you mentioned that uh, you thought that li for livestock production, you, we would need to uh, select for um, sorghums that uh, have a more spread out digest or is digested um, not, not so slowly, I, I suppose, would be uh, what you said. But um, so how do you see that? Um, an assay to analyze that? Is that an in vitro thing? Like how would we select for that? Well there, we've already seen some of that with the, the introduction uh, of the brown midrib characteristic in, in uh, the forage types where they tend to be more digestible than non-brown midrib types in the, uh, the, the primary rumen uh, and then uh, when you get into the gut, there's uh, a residual that is, is left for digestion there. Uh, but definitely rumen uh, evaluations are important. One of the things that 
alfalfa people recognized early on is particle size and to get that material down so that it will go from the rumen into the intestine is extremely important. So feeding sorghums that, uh, from a forage point of view, uh, that don't break down into smaller particle sizes, you simply are building up a residual that has to go over and over in the, the rumen before it can pass into the, to the gut. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for coming and for that wonderful talk. It is such a pleasure to have you here. And my question is, since you are the person that has been involved in both conversion programs, I wanted to ask you, what were the challenges that you had in the first conversion program that you are not having anymore in this second version? And what are the challenges of this second conversion program? Thank you. The first conversion program, the, the primary challenge was, is it going to work? <laughs> we really didn't know if it was going to work or not. Uh, and we had all of the mechanical situations that uh, the first F2 populations, uh, we didn't know how many genes were going to be segregating. We didn't know how big a population to grow. So. Fortunately, we were able to, to have enough land, so we grew eight rows, a thousand feet long, which gave us some place in the neighborhood of, of 7,000 plants to look at. Uh, and then, of course, uh, in one of the publications that, that we had prepared, uh, asked that silly question of how many uh, plants you need if you're going to have 75% uh, probability of selecting only one uh, of the recessives. Uh, those numbers fortunately uh, didn't work. Uh, so we had many more plants there than we needed. And then we began to be able to reduce, reduce the number of sizes of, of the F2s once we grew the first ones because we had an idea how many plants were or how many genes were actually segregating. But timing, I think, in the first one was really a major issue that we had. Being able to get things back from Puerto Rico to Texas and then enormously getting them back from Texas to Puerto Rico in time to plant. And looking at the gene system that's involved now uh, and working with with Dr. Bob Klein at a and and using these markers uh, to evaluate. And Pat uh, Brown has also made the, the same kind of uh, evaluation. Uh, our plant breeder's eye became a real problem for us because we were selecting inadvertently good looking phenotypes rather than trying to recover the, the exotic materials. So our plant breeder's eye was getting in the way of recovering the diversity that was there. Uh, that was one of the problems. The new system, I think, is, is really quite useful in that it gives us uh, markers that allow us to select for more diversity quicker. As the numbers show, out of a BC1 F2 to recover 85% of the markers, uh, genetics says we shouldn't be recovering but 75. And, you know, uh, that is a, a 10, 15% more efficient system. One of the other problems that we're having today is that we don't know if taxonomic groups of sorghums are actually being converted at the same rate of speed. For example, the, the guineas or the broom corns, uh, I don't think they're being converted at the same rate as the duras and the uh, caudatums are. Opening up new doors with the new technology. Very good question, thank you very much. We have a few questions from our webinar. Um, what is the adoption of a hybrid in Africa? 
I'm sorry? What is the adoption of a hybrid in Africa? It is dependent on country, uh, but the biggest ad adaptation problem in, in Africa is one of, uh, of economics and uh, distribution of seeds. Uh, South Africa, there's a high proportion of hybrids that are uh, being adapted. Uh, unfortunately, in the Sudan, which we would really like to see more adaptation because that's where the di major diversity comes from, it's slow. Uh, infrastructure is our major problem. North Africa, good adaptation. Uh, Algeria, uh, and so on. But Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, it's slow going. Infrastructure. Another online question is, what is the percent utilization for human consumption? Uh, the percent of, I'm sorry. How much is for human consumption, the percent oh, of sorghum? In, in the U.S. today, probably someplace in the neighborhood of 5 to 7 percent of our total production is going into human consumption today. But it's growing rapidly, as I indicated. And I think uh, it will never be much more than a, than a niche market uh, until there are major breakthroughs either in... Uh, complementary uh, cereal production, or if there is a major problem in one of the other major cereal grains, whether it be maize or wheat or rice. Thank you, and if there are no more questions, well, thank you again for coming. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>